Welcome everybody. Welcome to this exciting art talk featuring your BFA um, student artists. Um, really, really excited to hear straight from them today more about their work. Um, and um, so what they are going to be running the show tonight. So um, I'll be introducing um, them by name and then they're gonna take it away uh, for the most part talking about their work. And then there'll be an opportunity to ask a couple questions of each artist as we go through. Uh, we will be um, trying to move things along well so that everyone has a chance to um, speak this evening. Um, but then if we have time at the end, we can have open it up to more questions if there are. Um, so welcome, don't think I said my name. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Cynthia Cutting and I'm the director of the Museum of the White Mountains. Very, very proud to be um, sharing the stage with all these amazing, talented um, artists this evening and can't wait for them to take it all over. Thanks to um, my compadre, Rebecca, for being here, helping to um, have the technology and everything run really smoothly. She'll be a timekeeper this evening. Um, and yeah, so welcome, welcome. So what we're going to be doing is we're gonna be going through um, the um, artists by, organized by the group of um, um, artists that they are, uh, they worked in this year. Um, and we're gonna do it in reverse order um, than what we did at the opening, just to be fair. So we're gonna be starting with our studio artists this evening, uh, BFA in studio art. Um, and I am going to get ready. I'm gonna be um, beginning it by um, introducing um, Gwen. You'll be gonna be number one on the list. That's okay with you. And I'm going to um, share my screen. All right, take it away, Gwen. My name is Gwen Hoyt. I'm a painter, specifically an oil painter. It's something that I've always loved to do and I've continued since high school. So this year, my body of work focuses on life and death concepts. I've always been interested in things which other people would consider gross, but I think they're really interesting, like bones and worms and bugs. And so I portrayed that in my work just because I absolutely love it. So most of my compositions I created myself, like the flora and fauna piece on the far right. That's something that um, I arranged on a baking tray and I took a picture of all the different elements after I bought it from the store. I upped the saturation and printed it out and that was my reference, but I found that painting things from references gets a little bit boring. So then I tried painting things from life, which is the flower piece that you see in the center. Um, painting things from life is a different process, which is more fun for me because uh, I get to see the color changes every day. Every day there's something different that I get to paint, even though it's the same subject matter, just like the light changes. And I found that to be most interesting. I also get my references from my family. My mom gave me the ladybug reference from one of the places that she works. And I love the color palettes and I also love ladybugs. So I decided to paint that. So throughout this year, I've tried changing my style a bit, although most of my work is pretty unified. I wanted to try and change application of paint because I get bored really easily. So in the past, my work has been very complex, detailed, and refined. And then as I've continued throughout this year, I've tried loosening up a bit with the flower piece. That was something where if you actually look at it in person or look up close, you can see the chunks of paint. And I found that you know, loosening up a bit is way more fun and a much enjoyable process to do. So I tried to continue that. And even with the deer painting, although it looks pretty detailed for the final product, the process of it was a lot more freeing because I was able to splatter paint on the canvas and then like continue to do that and like and build up. And something that I really love about oil paint is layers. It gives me room to mess up and fix my mistakes and then come back and like redo, you know? So I absolutely love oil paint so much. Um, along with my style and brushstroke that I've tried altering a bit, I've also tried altering color palettes. I used to do a lot of gross and disturbing work in the past with a lot of dark, rich reds. And then I found that by focusing on the grubby, it kind of makes my brain a little bit dark. 
So I wanted to change that. And so I did something like the flower piece, which was my first attempt at something strictly beautiful without the contradiction of beautiful and gross and without like just the grubbiness of like blood. Um, it made me happier just switching between gross subject matters and then beautiful. And it was way more interesting along with switching color palettes from like neutrals to reds and back and forth. I also switched the complexity of my compositions. I like doing complex compositions because it challenges me a lot, but then it puts this like pressure in my head and I just wanted to feel a little bit more at ease. So then I um, switched to like the skull and the flower piece, which is single subjects. And that allows me to focus on one thing with color rather than color everywhere. And along with the color, which I love, I absolutely love saturated color. So along with changing color palettes, I also like changing feelings in my work. I like the audience to feel something, whether that be something gross and grubby or something really light and beautiful and happy. I think feeling is really important for the audience to capture. And I tried to portray that in my work because I always feel something when I'm painting. I put my heart and soul into all of my work. So I thought it was really important that I portray that to everybody. So yeah, I hope you like my life and death inspired art. And I hope you find the beauty and even the grossest of things like I do. Thank you. Good job, Gwen. Gwen, I think uh, you've really progressed amazingly this year and the range of work and the different stylistic approaches you've taken while they're all your hand, I think uh, are really interesting. And just as listening to you talking, I think uh, the work that you work from photographs, um, is, has a very different hand than uh, the stuff you've done in uh, from observation, which uh, I didn't really pick up on before until I'm watching the work uh, all together. So great job, really uh, solid work ethic beginning to end, excellent. Other questions for Gwen? I put one in the chat. Yeah, so Pine's question is, how do you reconcile the balance between the life and death motifs you use? Um, can somebody define reconcile just a second? How do So reconcile, <clears throat> reconcile is like to make sense of. So like you're kind of making sense of opposites and bringing them together. Okay, so a lot of my work, although it shows life and death, it's it's mostly dead things. So those flowers in that piece is dead, but I create life by adding the saturated color. Even those flowers are dead, but they look alive because of the color. So really, like I just choose subject matters which are interesting. And then when I'm I see it grow, I kind of see the life and the death elements that come out of it. So it's not really like I force it. It's something that comes natural. And yeah, I typically choose dead subject matters that I bring to life. So like the life aspect comes with the process. So from Andrew, how are you developing the meaning of the work while um, creating the painting? I kind of, I don't know, I just sit there and I just look and then all of a sudden, sudden something comes to my mind and I'm just like, that is exactly what I'm trying to get at. Um, does that answer the question? Wait. I think how so. Develop, yeah, how am I developing the meaning? It's kind of like, I don't know, I just pick things which I love and then once I sit and look at it, I kind of just make sense of it a little bit. It kind of just like, the realization just comes after the fact. Do you kind of just sit and look at it and wait until you keep, like you do realize it and then you know when that is? It's like a light bulb. It just yeah. happens right here. Awesome. 
Thank you. All right, so I think uh, we're, our time is up and we are ready for our next artist. Thank, Thank you. you, Rebecca. Nice time. Right. So, Ursula, this is going to be you. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm Ursula. I'm primarily a printmaker, but I dabble in um, a bunch of different mediums. The concept behind my um, big pieces you see on the screen is I've always found a deeper connection to animals than I have to people. And I feel like humans have created such an authority for themselves that we forget that we coexist with um, other creatures that deserve to be here just as much as we do. And I think one of the main factors that has to do with is we are physically bigger than the majority of the other creatures that we live on this earth with, which influences how we treat them. So humans kind of take advantage of um, their superiority on this world, which negatively impacts the other animals that we live with and the other animals' environments. Um, so basically with this series, I wanted to create the illusion that humans felt small while walking through this exhibition. And I wanted to give these creatures the chance to feel that authority and the superiority that humans possess every day. As far as the process goes, I used a process for the hair and the iguana and the rhino. I used a process called monotype printing, which is where I paint on a piece of plexiglass that's around like a foot and a foot and a half long. And it takes me like an hour to an hour and a half for each panel. And so for specifically the rhino and the iguana, I painted directly on my hands with the ink and I just like pressed it all over the piece of plexiglass and I used the back of a the back of a paintbrush and uh, sorry pieces of cut up map board to refine the detail and get the scales and the wrinkles which you see like in the leg specifically and all over the iguana's body but for the heron I used a palette knife to get the feathery the feathery brush strokes that you see throughout the entire body um, I kind of switched it up a bit with the big insects. I used chalk pastels because I realized that I really wanted to get precise, saturated, pigmented color that I couldn't get with monotypes. Because the monotype process, you don't really know what you're going to get when you're, when you're doing it. You just kind of throw it on the press bed and you just like crank it out and see if it comes, like you just hope it comes out good. But with the big insects, I really wanted to get precise detail that I couldn't attain through the um, making process, which is why I switched over. And I just, I hope that when you walk through this exhibition or on even on the Zoom link, you just feel the sense that the animals are taking control instead of humans, which we, we feel like we do every day. So I hope you enjoy. Nice. Good job, Ursula. Thank you. Any questions for Ursula? I make a comment. <clears throat> uh, one thing that Ursula didn't talk about was all the spontaneity in the process that she, uh, that happened in the process. Uh, when she was putting these together, she would make revisions, add pieces, take away, so it wasn't a clear cut kind of, oh, I have this idea, I'm just going to put it together. Uh, I watched these things, uh, a lot of them, uh, particularly the monotypes evolve in the fall. And it was really fascinating to see how inventive and creative she got in the actual process. So great job. Thank you. Great. Um, um, a question from Andrew. Uh, when do you choose to break the border of the paper? So that didn't really come about until later on. I kind of was just, well, uh, specifically with the heron, it was one of the second monotypes that I did. And I just collaged a bunch of pieces together and I would, all the mess ups, I would then take and cut up and then um, collage them in different aspects. So even the wing of the heron specifically, um, like in the center, it's not even a full panel. It's just like pieces of the mess ups. So then when I was, um, uh, when I was preparing them for the exhibition, I just went back in in certain areas that I felt like it would, it would be like a good place to just like have the heron pop out of the page or like have the rhino pop out of the page. And it wasn't until, it was basically just during the entire process 
specifically if I only if I only saw the light in one of the panels, I would only like cut up that portion and then I'd make that work into the big composition. So it just depended on um, what I saw in the panels and what I felt was right. That's awesome, Marcella. I think we've got time for one more question. So this is a good follow-up from Pine. Uh, why did you choose the red highlights in the heron? Is it blood? So I did, I did have a drawing to like the bloodiness of animals. And I had that in my work junior year specifically. And so when I started the series, I like carried on my old habits into this new, this new body of work that I made. So I just always liked the color red. I've always liked blood and it is technically blood, but it's also just like, I guess it could be red as just a pop of color as well. But it just so happens that in my head when I was working with it, it, it was blood, but it can be whatever. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Ursula. Great. Thank you. Nice job. Nice job. Okay. Now, um, wonderful. So um, next up is Issa, and you're going to share your screen, right? Yes. Go take it away. Okay. Perfect. All right. I think I might just move it. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, my name is Iza. I am a printmaking major, but I work with a lot of other mediums, especially this semester. I have really broadened my range um, to encapsulate more 3D and 2D work within the medium. Um, a lot of my work concentrates on my own personal experience with the natural world. I've grown up here. In New Hampshire, I've always had a very intimate relationship with the outdoors um, through being outside. I went to school on a farm, which gave me a really profound respect for living things um, in the natural world. So that really inspires me and what I do. Um, I focused on two things throughout the semester. Um, the first thing I focused on, um, I expanded my expertise into felting, both wet felting um, and dry felting, and then I also used um, felt bats, which was really interesting, which I'll get to at the end of the presentation. Um, and I focused more on these intimate scenes that I would come across. Um, I tried to take a walk every day and either take pictures or collect physical items and then work off of that. And obviously, I tried to be respectful of the natural world. I mean, with this bird's nest, I couldn't take it, obviously. Um, so I just took pictures um, and then worked off of that. Um, I also tried to incorporate some natural materials that were safe to take. Um, I ended up knocking the mushrooms that are on this cup off um, and I wanted to figure out a way to use them. Um, so I ended up gluing them to this ceramic piece that I had created. Um, which I used for a vessel for my acorns. Um, I took dead acorn caps and then I actually wet felted the acorns themselves and then adhered the two together. Um, and I really like the fact that the vessel is very organic as well by nature. Um, I really enjoy the way that came out. Um, and then this is the other process I did. I worked with um, that like felt batting or bats of felt, which is a whole different material from the loose felt that I was using previously. And I focused primarily on topographic maps, which are something I've been interested in a really, for a really long time. Um, I always grew up with maps in my house. Um, and I think it's a really interesting aesthetic um, and it relates heavily to our local community and our local area. Um, so this is definitely one of the more abstract maps that I've created, um, but it's based very loosely on um, the Kinsman range, which is um, very close to the, where I grew up. Um, and it's also the largest piece. So each one of these canvas panels, I think are six by eight. Um, and then in the center, that mountain right there um, is made up of about 20 layers, um, which is unfortunate that 
you guys are not seen in person um, because it, the layers create a lot of really interesting shadows and depth um, kind of with the ways you look, which the, uh, the pictures don't encapsulate very well. Um, but also if anybody does see it in person, you can feel free to touch it. Um, all the material is completely stable to touch. Um, and then my last one, this is the most recent piece I've done. I decided to move away from the canvas. Um, having that square base, I found very constricting um, and it made the whole piece end up very square looking, um, even no matter how much I built up on top of it. Um, so I got rid of the canvas and began just building off of the felt bats. Um, and I began to develop a little bit more of a defined palette of earthy tones, which I found really hard with the felt. Um, felt tends to be these really neon kind of elementary school type colors. Um, so I've been trying to really narrow down my selection and create a solid palette. Um, and then these are very abstract. These are only loosely based on um, some of the maps that I've looked at, mainly um, in the White Mountains and also in the, also in the Crawford Range. Um, and then for the two in between, I decided, um, these are the first pieces I did, and I decided to stitch into each layer with black embroidery floss. And I really liked the way they came out. Um, and I was debating doing all six of them. However, I felt like if I did all six, um, a lot of it, a lot of the um, detail within the layers would have gotten lost within the stitching. So I decided on just the two. And that is all I have. Good job. All right, thank you, Issa. So question from Pine with a great question. Is there a connection between your tactile art and the tactile nature of your younger years? Yes, definitely. Um, I am a very tactile person in general. I really like mediums um, that have that type of handmade or tactile value to them. Um, and again, I went to school for most of my elementary school years on a farm, um, which I think plays into it a lot. Um, Merlin, this might be a question that you can help us with. Do we have any pictures of um, Isa hanging up the individual pieces of her work? We can so. I, I feel like um, possibly on, if it's not on the website, then definitely um, we can get Stephen to take individual if need be. Awesome. Thank you, Merlin. All right. Nobody else has any questions. I think that we can move on to our next um, artist. Thank you, Isa. Great job. Good job. Okay, next up is going to be um, Cassie, and Cassie, I'm going to share your PowerPoint. Um, okay. Okay, right. take it away. Hi, I'm Cassie. Um, I'm a painter and a digital artist. Um, my work this year has been all about the relationships between uh, plants and uh, humans, uh, or just nature and humans in general. Um, I'm very concerned with conservation. Um, it's just been something, you know, obviously that's building up in the news and the media and it's just something like I've taken a bunch of courses on it. Um, so I've become increasingly concerned and I wanted to use my art to talk about that concern. Um, it sort of started this series as a uh, reaction to the California wildfires in 2020. Um, it was the largest uh, wildfire season recorded in modern history. Um, so I wanted to sort of make a painting about that. And then it sort of bloomed as like a, a series. Uh, it didn't really start it as that, but um, it became one. 
Um, and when the viewer is looking at these paintings, I want them to think about how bright the colors are and just sort of juxtapose that with how dismal it is that we're sort of kind of destroying our environment and how the wildfires affect us and ecosystems in those areas. Um, you can switch to the next slide. Okay. Um, however, I do really love nature. Uh, so I wanted to sort of talk about the positive relationships as well as the negative relationships. So I did a series on my house plant, um, sort of keeping in mind the idea um, about how we keep plants as pets. Um, and so I started just drawing my house plant. And so I did one and then I did another and then I did another. Uh, you could switch to the next slide. Okay. And then sort of from there, um, I was thinking about using it as like a digital media, mostly because um, digital art is a lot less harmful to the environment. Um, so it sort of corresponds to the idea of this series, um, as well as the fact that I've just been increasingly moving toward it as my primary medium because it's a little bit more forgiving and I just, uh, I just like it. So <laughs> it's fun to do. Um, you can switch to the next slide. Okay, and you will notice that uh, increasingly these get more and more abstract as we go. Um, I was sort of trying to break out of that one way of doing it. So I wanted to make more and more ways of, of, ways of presenting this same idea. How can I make it different? How can I move forward? Um, yeah, you can move to the last slide. And I sort of landed on these. Um, I like these probably the best out of the entire series. Um, they're simple, they're clean, and I just enjoy looking at them. And I think that's really important to me. Um, I mean, it sort of corresponds to the whole idea of like how we like looking at our house plants. We just like them in our houses to say that we have them or we just like looking at them. And um, it sort of just makes me think about how plants are kind of like living art. Um, and so, yeah, I hope you like my work. Awesome. So question from Pine. Uh, the circles are prevalent in your later works. Is there a conceptual reason for them? I don't think, honestly, I really had a reason for it. I think I was trying to see it in a different light. So I wanted to sort of think about how I could make each piece different. And that was just one way of doing it. Um, but it is something that I'm moving toward like a lot. Like I've been using it in uh, almost everything now, just because I really like doing it. <laughs> Um, and I think it sort of like takes your eye out of it and makes it more, it gives a little more depth. I think just like visually, I really like it. And that's kind of the only reason. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Cassie. There are some great comments in the chat, so you should definitely check them out. Any more questions for Cassie? Okay, nice job for work. Okay, um, so next we're going to move to our multimedia students. Um, and first up is Callie. You there, Callie? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Okay, everyone can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, my name is Callie Dawson and I am a student in the BFA Multimedia Program. My intent as an artist is to show the viewer something that has always been there but has never been recognized. I make art that is a configuration of real elements that don't typically go together. Here I have a table covered in gum. I've covered the entire eating area while placing a nice dinner setting on top. Gum is something that is known for being stuck under the table and I feel like everyone has had the panic and disgust of touching someone else's gum underneath the table. 
So I wanted to take this feeling and kind of just put it where you eat um, and just kind of make the viewer feel something about that. <laughs> Um, this is a piece by Richard Jackson. He is um, an artist that inspires me because he makes these scenes, like this is, you could say, a dinner scene, but it has so many chaotic things going on in it. You can't really pinpoint what's actually happening. Um, two other inspirations of mine are Tim Noble and Sue Webster. They made this piece um, called Wild Mood Swings. This piece is really interesting to me because they've taken all these different um, tiny pieces and without the light, you wouldn't really know what it is. But as soon as the light is shined on it, you can see this recognizable figure. When I started Thesis, I was overwhelmed by the idea of figuring out what my direction was in my art. It was the first time that I didn't have a prompted assignment for assignment for something. Um, this is the first piece that I did. It's a hand made of cigarettes and a carton of cigarettes made of fingers. Um, this was a piece that I struggled with because again, I didn't really know what was expected of me or what I was supposed to really be doing. Um, here is another piece. This is a baked bean lollipop. It's about three feet long and a foot wide. Throughout my college career, I have always gravitated towards, make, towards making art that was weird and sometimes unsettling, but I don't really acknowledge that. Um, I feel like it was just something that was always there, but like I didn't really notice it as a direction. I thought that shock was an element I was going for in my art, but then I soon realized that nobody really can define their work as shocking because that term is so different to everybody. Um, now that I have a sense of the direction I'm going in, I've been able to come up with stronger pieces and focus in on other elements that I enjoy doing in my art. One of the one of those elements being that Plaster is a medium that I found I really liked working with and also making these pieces that the majority of it is white, but I add these accents of colors. For example, in this one, the corn on this foot sculpture, the feet being white, but the, the corn being yellow like your dad's toenails. <laughs> Or another example is these white plaster butts that I've made, the pickle bean green, a yellow flower, and an orange cheese well. I've found that doing this is something that can make the piece stronger by just adding accents on the parts that I want to be rec recognized the most. A lot of times I come up with art I come up with not just things that you wouldn't think of, but you wouldn't want to think of. Combinations that you probably would never pair with each other. Uh, what I like, what I'd like the viewer to see is this configuration of themes that I've come up with and experience some kind of feeling like humor. Humor is definitely a theme in my work. Throughout this journey through thesis, I now understand that my focus is about making these configurations that look almost recognizable and could be real, but they're so contradicting of each other that no one would ever think of it. And that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Callie. So actually perfect question for while this picture is up, how many pieces of gum are on that table? There is 1,024 pieces of gum. <laughs> I, when I bought the gum, I was thinking that I bought way too much and it actually ended up being that I really had to spread the gum out to be able to cover the whole table. <laughs> uh, great question. Any other questions for Callie? A oh, uh, question from Robin. Do you think viewers would know that that was gum without an explanation? And does it have a scent? Um, 
it definitely has a bubblegum scent. Um, when you see it in person, you can definitely tell that it is bubblegum and obviously smell. I don't really think that the photos do it as much justice as seeing it in person, but yeah. Um, question from Jay. Well, actually, oh, there's a ton of questions here. So Kelly, you might have to um, answer a few of them in the chat afterward. Okay. Um, let's see. Question from Jake. Uh, do you prefer humor or repulsion slash disgust? I think they both coexist within my art as a combination. I don't really like going towards like gruesome or like too gory or anything like that. I feel like I like to have these kind of unsettling themes, but the humor kind of lightens them up. Wonderful. All right, Kelly, I think your time is up. So thank you so much and we'll go on to our next speaker. Nice, thank you, Kelly. Next up is Pine, your turn. Take it away. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> all right, can we all see it? Yes. So my name is PJ Hakobian, and this body of work is the culmination of my year exploring PTSD through art. Oh, it won't go to the next page. Oh. Of course. No. Sorry. I apologize. There we go. I am a woodworker and I use wood carving to create small sculptures to explore individual aspects of PTSD and to show how trauma is pe present at all times, not just from the incident when it actually occurs, but throughout all of your life afterwards. And each piece I make is, a, is meant to represent a specific part of my own PTSD that stems from violence against me due to me being mixed. So each piece is an individual aspect of my own personal experiences. So this piece, when you look at it, who is the bad guy? This piece is meant to represent the confusion of violence itself and how during a violent situation, it can be hard to tell who is the good guy and who is the bad guy, especially if there's more than one person involved in the situation. So maybe the person in physical contact with you isn't attacking you, they're trying to protect you from the attacker, but in those high stress, high adrenaline situations, it's kind of hard to tell which is which. So I made this piece to kind of highlight that confusion, like, is the figure with the red eyes on the bottom be, having something ripped out of them that's a part of them? Or are they attacking the tall figure with the hollow eyes and is the tall figure defending themselves? I made it so those lines were kind of unclear to show and kind of highlight that confusion that comes with violent experiences. And then this piece represents really to the fullest extent the widespread impact of PTSD because this imagery is from a night terror that I had showing that even when I'm asleep or even when people with PTSD are asleep, you're not, you can't escape from it, it's there. And this, this piece, the dream I was stuck in place, I couldn't move and I was kind of observing this creature like it didn't know I was there. And then almost if it, realized, if it had realized me, it kind of turned to me and it had just plucked an eyeball out of this person it had caught. And as it turned to me, it dropped the eyeball and started to move in my direction. And that's when I woke up. And I, I made this piece to kind of catch that, like it's staring right at you. It's looking at you kind of vibe that this creature had in the night terror, but also that PTSD kind of has in the back of your mind all the time when you're asleep or when you're awake. This piece I made to represent 
this, the struggle of overcoming PTSD once you have it, the chains holding this figure are meant to represent the trauma itself, preventing you from moving forward and like becoming a fully fledged person. It definitely keeps you in one place and keeps you stuck. Um, the blindfold is meant to represent the fear and the inability to see past the trauma because it definitely blinds you to think that you're still in those dangerous situations, even though you're not anymore. And I have an eye in the center of the piece that allows light to come through. And that's meant to represent that there is a possibility for that overcoming, getting to that better part of life, getting to that lighter side of life. It's just, you have to get through the chains to get there. And then this is my final piece. And this piece represents the physical place in which some of those violent situations have happened. Um, it's meant to be almost inviting with this hand reaching out to you, but then kind of eerie because the hand is reaching out of just kind of a black void. And I tried to have this kind of duality, the eerie and the inviting at the same time, because the woods were a place where those violent situations took place, but they were also a place of safety. I got I've gotten out of a couple situations because it was in the woods and I could use the woods to get away, but it also happened because the woods can't be dangerous. So I tried to highlight that duality in this piece and really show that kind of mix of emotions. It's a safe place, but also it's a dangerous place. And with PTSD, it's kind of hard to distinguish between the two. And these are my pieces and this is my complete work and my, Websites at the bottom there, and my Instagram is at the top. Nice job. Thank you, Pine. That's really, really special and important to hear. Um, question from Merlin. Um, do these carving pieces allow you to have more patience in your daily life? I would say no. It, you would think that Carving is something you take a lot of time to do, but it's, it's definitely meditative to do it. But once you stop doing it, that it's right back there. You're not any more calm. I'm calm in the moment, but it doesn't really help outside of the actual carving. More of a technical question from Spencer. What tools are you using to get in there with the details? A Dremel, a blade? No, I use, I use only hand tools. I drill holes in the beginning. But after that, it's all hand done, hand tools. And it's, I have micro chisels that are about like the size of a needle head for all the small details. That's great. Um, question from Molly. Is there a particular reason you work on such a small scale? It's, it's definitely for convenience because if I work small, I can create more than one. Cause these, all of these pieces are under six inches. Um, the chains is the biggest one that's about six inches. And then the forest is small. It's about four inches. It can fit in the palm of your hand. And it really just allows me to make multiple. I think that's one of the things you don't realize until you see them in person is actually how small they are. Um, question. So the next question would be in the first piece and in some of your other art, you use snakes quite free. Uh, sorry, frequently, are they symbolic in any way? I don't, I don't think they have any heavy sim symbology. It's just the, the imagery itself flows very well and they lead to that flow. So snakes are just a, a helpful tool for giving pieces flow. All right, wonderful. There's some really great comments in the, in the chat, fine. So definitely check that out. And then I think we are uh, for us to move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Pam. Next up is Andrew. Take it away. Thank you. All right. Hold on. All right. Are we all good? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Heath. I'm a BFA student and I'm a multimedia artist. Um, I'm trying to make socially critical work that asks the viewer to explore the relationship between the culture and the society that they find, us, uh, find themselves in. I can consider my work similar to that of a uh, editorial cartoon. Um, 
it seems that too often in uh, our life, we're asked to look at things in a very flat way. And I'm trying to fight against that and ask viewers to look at the deeper complexities of the world that we find ourselves in. Oh, all right. Um, so uh, in this piece, we have Johnny's Play Blocks, which is a series of six inch and um, eight inch blocks with uh, pornography printed on them. And they're, um, they're asked for the viewer to uh, get down and start manipulating them on their own and start to play with them and interact with the piece. Um, it was really important for me to get people to interact with the artwork and in to participate in not only what I have to say, but what I want them to start to consider themselves. Uh, the only issue with this piece is that I, um, the issue with this piece is that uh, when I finished it, COVID hit and we were uh, quickly put into quarantine and I wasn't actually able to display the work in a way that people were able to play with it. So while some people were able to see it, it's, it made me have to reconsider what actually was possible with my work and how to get people to interact with it, um, get stuff out there and get people to actually start interacting with the ideas that I want them to play with. Um, I wanted to show off a couple artists that I'm looking at just to give you a context of what I'm thinking about these days. Uh, here we have Jenny Holzer and she, what she does is she'll project her truisms, a bunch of uh, phrases onto uh, important buildings, political buildings, uh, public spaces so that she's able to take her artwork outside of uh, traditional artistic context to reach people who don't normally look at art to get them to start questioning the world that they're in. Uh, we also have, uh, and, and I apologize for this uh, pronunciation, but uh, Christoph Wadiko, uh, was <laughs> Wadisko, um, he uh, also uses projectors and he also projects onto public buildings. What I think is interesting about this particular work uh, called Works is that they've recently re-projected it um, into, uh, you know, onto the same building only a few years ago to start recontextualizing the current issues that we're having. Now, this was projected uh, back in 1988 but you can imagine a lot's changed since then and a work has a life between um, when it was created and when it, um, when it can, is constantly redisplayed, which is something that I'd like to get through with my work. Uh, here we have the Celebrity Christ, which is about seven inches tall or seven feet tall. Um, and what I'm really trying to get across is, is I'm, start, I'm using um, the audio video of uh, celebrities using their platform to uh, to talk about Christianity to a whole bunch of people, and I'm trying you know I'm trying to make parallels to that to the actual narratives that they're believing in that they're following in, and I'm setting it up in such a way with common material uh, using a projector, an old projector, plywood, leaving the wires out so that people are comfortable with the material. I like to use common material and common um, or readily available objects um, so that there's a familiarity to the work that I'm making. Um, and in this case, there's even a familiarity to the subjects that I'm, I'm kind of uh, discussing and diagnosing. So here we happen to have Chris Pratt talking on um, some Nickelodeon award show. Um, and then I'm also working with uh, things that I find from the past. Um, here we have um, baby commercial and I'm, I was able to source a commercial from 1974 for a body product that um, its tagline is nothing sexier than a fresh born baby who grew up to be very sexy. Um, I have that playing on loop while projected over a, a stroller with no wheels and a mannequin. Um, I'm taking all these common objects and publicly available um, videos and I'm able to splice them together to take information from the past, ideas from the past, our current ideas of those things, mix them with what people currently think and ask people to start reconsidering um, what they're asked to be true. 
Um, I thank you for your time. Uh, I've been Andrew Heath. This is my website, by the way. Thank you, Andrew. So it looks like there's some, there's an oh my God comment about the sexy baby commercial, which I definitely have to say every time I turn that on and it starts, I'm just like, I can't believe this is a real thing. <laughs> I didn't quite believe it either. <laughs> yeah, it's really disturbing. <laughs> Um, so a comment from Robin, um, I like that your website is fine arts, but some of what you do seems to subvert the fine part of fine arts. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Thank you for that question. Um, fine arts is kind of a tricky term, isn't it? I, I'm trying to make a lot of um, maybe socially critical work. I think fine art has been playing in that field for a long time, and especially in contemporary work it's been breaking out of what might be considered traditional fine territories such as galleries and museums. Um, I think playing within that territory and maybe asking those questions of what is fine art um, is greatly important for all of us to maybe ask. Awesome. All right. Um, thank you, Andrew. I think um, we will go on to our next speaker. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, Excellent. Okay. Um, and with that, we are going to move into our graphic designer group. Um, and first up in that group is Spencer. Spencer, take it away. All right. Let me just share the screen. Can everyone see that all right? Yes, sir. All right. I am Spencer Cook, and I am a BFA graphic design student, and most importantly, an artist. I created the company Urban Skis for my business for this project, and I created the company as an actual possibility or a high quality, inexpensive alternative to your typical ski equipment that usually costs thousands of dollars. Um, it's actually something that I had been thinking about doing for a while. Uh, this notepad is actually like 10 years old. So it's been a thought in my head for quite some time. And this, uh, this project, helped it come into a possible reality. And I had spent the last 15 years of my life as a professional skier. Um, and the, the problem of expensive ski equipment is like very real because resort costs are crazy high. And I just thought that I could actually change the industry while using my art and making a good project for my thesis. Um, I had gone through a couple of ideas, as you can see with this idea board. Uh, I had initially gone with the idea of city skis, but later came back to urban skis because I found it was uh, more relatable in the free ski community. And I decided to take it away and start making decals and stickers with some of the design work that I had come up with. Um, so here's some decals. I made some shirts and apparel to market the company. And then this photo is actually taken of me. Um, it's what I use for a couple of my advertisements and my posters. And this is taken in Bedford, New Hampshire. So this was maybe six years ago. And I decided it'd be pretty cool to include into my artwork. Um, this is 
an actual video of the shot. There's a long intro, sorry. That's still going. Okay. Hmm. Is that I don't know if that made it through. I couldn't tell. We'll continue. I was hoping to focus most of my project on these ski designs. Uh, these are done with paintings that I had actually created in the past. Uh, this one was my most recent creation of a photo of my fiance. And I thought it would be cool to incorporate that into the skis. And this painting I had initially done for my first graphic design project that I ever did in Plymouth State. And it had evolved into another painting class with, uh, with Tom Driscoll. And I thought that that would be awesome to incorporate into the skis. Then I printed them out on um, sections into like sticker paper and these this was the result so i was pretty pleased to see them actually come to fruition uh i had begun using a drawing tablet and experimenting with a lot of the uh the programs on here this is done with a program called sketch and i thought it was just a really cool way to incorporate painting into my graphic designing. And this piece, I think, brought it all together, uh, in my opinion, just because like this is a photo of me originally, um, and I was able to bring it into the drawing tablet to create a digital painting and actually use it for posters and displays for graphic design. So I thought that that was really cool to be able to bring it all together as one. This is just a video to see how like close in detail that you could really get with this uh, digital painting. And I just think it's cool how technology is advanced and you can actually do everything you want all in one little place. And that. That is my uh, logo, that is my website, and I appreciate all of you guys coming out here and looking at our artwork. Nice job, Spencer. Excellent. Doesn't look like there's any questions in the chat, um, but there's some great comments. So I think we can move on to our next person. Oh, actually one question from Tom. Uh, what do you do to make your skis less expensive? Hmm. Uh, there's a lot of inflation in the market. Like typically it really only costs about $200 to build a ski and it's, I mean, a pair of skis can cost upwards of $2,000 just based on name and brand and greed, I guess, not for the love of the sport. So that would be my plan. Nice. That's great. All right. Uh, thank you, Spencer. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and we are gonna go on to Brianna. 
Brianna, you've got your PowerPoint to share. Okay. My name is Brianna. I'm a graphic design student and my company that I decided to create is called Just a Sprinkle. And it's a bakery. I decided to do an adult side and a kid's side version. Oh, it's not letting me, there we go. So my mission for Just a Sprinkle is, it's a family focused bakery that provides desserts and fun activities for everyone. We wanna give families that comfort of home in every bite, as well as adding a pizzazz of sprinkles. And so for my adult side, I decided to do two logos, one having the like red velvet color and then the other one being just the inverse with a red velvet background. Um, and also some background information I'll include is the reason behind this bakery is because me and my mom, we love to bake. And so I kind of wanted to make a company hoping that she would turn it into something, but she won't, but it's okay. <laughs> um, and so these are some of the colors that are used throughout the adult side. They're very neutral. Uh, my stationery, I have this bite mark here and I kind of use that throughout a lot of my pieces. I use that in the design guide. Um, if you go in the museum, it's laying out on one of the tables. And then some posters, I decided to include a lot of photography and again, the neutral colors throughout all my pieces for this side. And these are some more. And then I included a handouts where we have like a loyalty card, a, just, a guest check, a dessert order form and a menu that also has the bite mark and the same thing with the loyalty cards. And then for my menu, um, I kind of wanted to create a chalkboard effect. So I made this side for the kids have kind of have like those fun colors that you'll see in a couple slides. And then the adult side kind of have more of the neutral colors. And then for the kids side, I wanted to make it like fun and eye catching. And I also created these illustrations here uh, that are used throughout a lot of my pieces as well. And then these are the colors that are used throughout everything. And then these are some of my posters. Again, they have that bright, fun color with the illustrations that I've created. And then we have some birthday invitations and then another loyalty card for children. And then this is some of my merchandise. I did some t-shirts for both sides. And then I did some mugs and cups and then I did packaging. And then I think that is it. Wow, that's a lot of products. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you shared all of those, Brianna. Nice job. I'm just going to stay on this page. <laughs> Are there questions for Brianna? I'm just somebody who says that they would definitely be a regular at your bakery. <laughs> the designs are so satisfying to look at. And I agree. <laughs> it's making me hungry. <laughs> too. But it looks like that is it. So many great comments, everybody. Definitely got to spend time with them. Um, and now we are moving on to our um, final student for this evening, and that is Nathan. Ready to go? Yep. Go for it. Oh, sorry. So I made 
Um, I'm Nathan, I'm a graphic design major, and I decided to make a whiskey company. Um, this on the left was my original design. Uh, it was supposed to be sort of demonic looking. I was going to try to include a bunch of colors and have that be like what stands out the most, um, which in the red, you can it's sort of face shaped. Um, I decided to move away from that and just go to the outlines and let people see what they want. It's either like a demonic set of wings or you can see the face that's kind of hidden in the middle of it. Um, and then for my whiskey, I had three different kinds. The normal um, bourbon, which it uses the design that's on the right. And then I also had an apple and a honey flavor. So these were the two designs that I made for those. Um, I went with the snake and the apple, just thinking of like the Garden of Eden and the snake gives them the apple and then just the bee for honey. Um, this is just some of my stationery. So the two just like letterheads, um, I decided to go with one that was just plain white and one that um, faded down to black with a little bit of the um, logo on the edge of it, which I must have accidentally cropped this a little too small because it's supposed to go further. And then the front and back of my business cards all the way to the right. Um, two of my poster designs just using the original logo and the slogan, which is sign over your soul. Um, and then as well as a poster for each of the different flavors. Um, I went with a pattern in the background just to give it more of a feeling of the one, the animal that's on it, just for some textural and just for another design element. And here's another poster similar to the bee, but with the um, original logo that I have. And last, a, a picture of an actual whiskey glass. And yeah. That is all. Awesome. Thank you, Nathan. So I guess our first question, uh, what inspired you to use religious references? Uh, what was the question again? I'm oh, sorry. What inspired you to use religious references? Uh, none whatsoever. All right. Any other questions? Nice job. Wow. Well, um, we could take a couple other questions if people have for folks, but I just want to say uh, yet again, I am blown away by this group of students. Bravo, everyone. What fantastic presentations you made of your work. Really, really great job. Nice work. I hope everybody else feels that way because I sure do. <laughs> it's a great, great. Um, testimony to, to all the work that you've done this year and the amazing deep thinking and uh, really, um, my yeah, so many ideas. Really, really awesome job. Really impressed. So thank you, everybody. And thanks to everybody for coming this evening to support these artists and to ask some questions. Um, it's great to have you here. And um, yeah, and if you can come, um, if you have a PSU ID, you can come see the show. Um, for one more week. Um, so do come and see it. And if not, um, definitely enjoy the online um, exhibition. So thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>